সুপ্রিয় চিকিৎসক বৃন্দ সবাইকে আজকের ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট সেশনে স্বাগতম আমাদের আজকের টপিক অফথালমোস্কোপি হোয়াট এ ফিজিশিয়ান মাস্ট নো শুধু অফথালমোস্কোপি যে শুধুমাত্র অফথালমোলজিস্টের জন্য ইম্পর্টেন্ট তা না অফথালমোলজিস্ট বিশেষ করে মেডিসিনের সমস্ত সেক্টরই অত্যন্ত ইম্পর্টেন্ট ইটস এ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট ডায়াগনস্টিক টুল ফর ক্লিনিশিয়ান অ্যান্ড ইন্টারনিস্ট অলসো প্রথমেই আমি আজকে আমাদের আজকের স্পিকারকে পরিচয় করে দিই লেট মি ইন্ট্রোডিউস আওয়ার টুডেজ স্পিকার প্রফেসর জ্ঞানেন্দ্র ল্যামিচিনি প্রফেসর অফ অফথালমোলজি ক্যাটারেক্ট অ্যান্ড রেটিনা স্পেশালিস্ট লুম্বিনি আই ইনস্টিটিউট অ্যান্ড রিসার্চ সেন্টার হিজ ফ্রম নেপাল অ্যান্ড হিজ a very good oil user of bangladesh so whenever i ask him to take session for us he always take it very seriously and he always take always try to take very good preparation uh, it was it is his second session it is first session on diabetic retinopathy was outstanding that was absolute master class that was so i am extremely happy and honored to get him again in our uh, pd physicians facebook group so i am very much honored so without doing further delay i am inviting uh, professor ganendra lamichin uh, to deliver his talk thank you <clears throat> so let me share my screen so is it visible is my screen visible am i audible no, yes, yes sir yes sir yes uh, thank you dr ahsan uh, first of all i like to Uh, thank bd physician entire group to giving me this opportunity once again and i am really impressed by the activity academic activity conducting by bd physician i am watching it on and off and it's very impressive and so you people are doing extremely hard job and i like to give you a big congratulation so today uh, i am to first of all i'd like to apologize for, for a little bit delay in starting my presentation it was supposed to prepare a little bit earlier but due to uh my busy schedule i couldn't make it in time after diabetic retinopathy so let's uh, without delay begin my session so these are my disclosures uh, as we know that uh, we have mainly targeted for physicians some of the my colleagues in this group may be ophthalmologists uh, for them it may be look like a very basic things but i have mainly targeted for physicians uh, colleagues and uh, we'll mainly discussed on direct ophthalmoscopy which is mainly used uh, by uh, physician uh, rather indirect ophthalmoscopy is mainly used by ophthalmologist so i am not going to discuss detail about that so we will be concentrate to concentrate on direct ophthalmoscopy and we will be covered mainly the practical aspects rather than the theory portion we will try to uh, cover the practical aspects so that sir at the slide show the dia dilo bhalo hobe slide so i think slide yes so is it is it coming uh, no sir rough first slide they dekhte se ekdom slide show hoy nai i have kept in slides so that means uh, is it okay but ganam uh, do it's not uh, you didn't give it as a slide show we are watching your slides but not a slide show mm. slides are visible it's okay So in in my computer it's busy like a slide is slide there no slide show in my computer onik just give him some instruction he ah. understand bangla very well sir to mane slide off kore abar jodi ekto share korten tahole bhalo hoto share screen the entire screen ta share kore den tahole ar somoshya hobe na slide select na kore ar প্রথমে যে স্ক্রিনটা আসে শেয়ারে দিলে ওইটা শেয়ার করে দিলে তাহলে আসলে সমস্যা হবে ইজ ইট ওকে না লেট মি ওকে সেম ইজ ইট ওকে ওকে না ওকে ইয়েস সো সো দিস আর মাই ডিসক্লোজারস অ্যাজ আই হ্যাভ মেনশনড সো আই এম মেইনলি টকিং অন দা প্র্যাকটিক্যাল অ্যাসপেক্টস সো দিস আর সাম অফ মাই ডিসকাশন আউটলাইন উইল ডিসকাস হোয়াটস দা ইম্পর্টেন্ট অফ অফথালমোস্কোপি type of ophthalmoscopy and we will mainly concentrate on direct ophthalmoscopy its setting ex external examination and pathology and uh, later on we will have some question and answer session so let's begin i think we all know this gentleman and this program as well uh, so uh, 
there it is uh, i have kept six uh, questions it is for self assessment you don't have to press anything to answer just realize within yourself so first question is how often do you do direct ophthalmoscopy in your patient by yourself whether you do in selected cases whether in all cases whether you don't do at all but refer to ophthalmologist whether you not do at all and you even don't refer to ophthalmologist so you analyze yourself in which category you usually like to be there next one is if you do uh, a di uh, direct ophthalmoscopy so what are the common scenarios you commonly prefer to do a direct ophthalmoscopy whether it's on diabetic patients only or hypertensive patients only or both diabetic and hypertension or as per need you usually do direct ophthalmoscopy in different cases in your clinics so third one uh, do you have any idea what is the area of fundus seen by direct ophthalmoscopy it is about 1.5 mm which we usually cause a 1 dx diameter or 2 3 or 4 so we will get this answer in subsequent uh, subsequent slides just for your knowledge you just uh, you do self analysis and what is the field of view of direct ophthalmoscopy whether it is 10 degree 20 degree 30 degree or 40 degree and what is the magnification by direct ophthalmoscopy do you have any idea just uh, do self uh, analysis it is 3 times 10 times 14 times or 20 times and what is the nature of image formed by direct ophthalmoscopy it is erect or inverted inverted so these are some of the common questions for self analysis so we will get this answer uh, as we move on our subsequent slides so let's start what is ophthalmoscopy to be very simplified and very simple it is nothing a big deal it is the method by which the magnified image of the fundus what we call ocular fundus which can be seen so basically there are two types we'll have in subsequent slides one is called direct ophthalmoscopy where the image is erect that means whatever you see through the direct ophthalmoscope it is the same picture what we exist in reality whereas in indirect ophthalmoscopy the picture is exactly reversed so if you see uh, some picture inside the retina through your indirect ophthalmoscopy if you want to draw you have to draw it in inverted position so that is the basic difference between direct ophthalmoscopy and indirect ophthalmoscopy so why ophthalmoscopy why do we need the ophthalmoscopy first of all it is told that the eye is a window to systemic disease so there are a lots of condition we will see in subsequent slides that with the simply with the fundus examination we can have some idea about or we can have some claims to the diagnosis to systemic diseases and interestingly retina is the only portion of central nervous system which is visible from the exterior and viewing the fundus is a great way to get a sense for the patient overall status of vasculature and fundoscopy examination can discover pathological processes which otherwise is invisible such as endocarditis disseminated candidemia cytomegalovirus retinitis in hiv and being able to stage the both diabetes and hypertension which is the most commonly used indication for direct ophthalmoscopy by physician in their clinic and obviously most of the time we used to see the fundus before doing the lumbar puncture to see the status of the whether the intracranial pressure is raised or not so let's have some basic anatomy of the eye we all know that from our mbbs knowledge that eye has three coats that is outer coat is called sclera and cornea middle coat is called uveal coat and the inner one is called as the retina and let's go a, the, a little bit deep into the retina so retina is a light sensitive tissue of inner layer of the eye just as what we compare with the reel of the camera but nowadays there is all digital camera there is no film like camera but we can compare with this one and this is a it basically consists of the three part the center you can see this is the optic disc which is also called optic nerve head and blood vessels and macula so macula out of the whole retina the macula is the most light sensitive part of the retina which is specialized for high acuity of vision and uh, before being mastering into the direct ophthalmoscopy we at you at least we all must have some basic idea about what is how does a normal retina looks like so you can clearly see in this picture so this is the optic nerve head or optic disc and you can see there is the vasculature 
this thick one is one what we call is the retinal vein or venules and the smaller one is the retinal arteriole whereas the center portion of this uh, one is called as the macula which is almost two uh, three millimeter away from the optic disc and the center of the macula is called as the fovea so this is the normal anatomy which use you usually seen with the direct ophthalmoscopy and we all know that the image of the object falls in the retina in an inverted position and our optic nerve takes it to the brain and ultimately it, the image becomes inverted. And uh, for the beginners, we always suggest to start direct ophthalmoscopy in a dilated pupil because uh, it's very difficult to appreciate all the changes uh, in the uh, small or constricted pupil. So the commonly we can use the tropicamide eye drops, but you should be very aware to counsel the patient because we know that it is the tropicamide is a short acting cyclopasic midriatics, which cause the pupillary dilatation and also uh, paralysis of the ciliary muscles. So which ultimately lead to the blurring of the vision for four to six hours. So if you don't count, so you should counsel the patient that once you put this dilating drop, patient may have difficulty in driving and doing near work for four to six hours. Sometimes patient may come in your clinic with the driving. So they may be difficult. So you have to counsel the patient beforehand. So what are the tools for examining the human ocular fundus or human retina? So one is the one screening tool is the direct ophthalmoscopy, which we'll going to discuss in detail a little bit later. Besides this uh, screening tool, there are a lots of other screening tool for retina. That is indirect ophthalmoscopy, which is the binocular in nature. So it is two types. One is head mount, which you can see in this figure. And another one is the slit lamp based, where we use the extra condensing lens. Beside this, we have fundus camera, which is non-portable and fixed into the table. We can take the picture of the whole retina. And nowadays we have smartphone camera which is both portable, mediatic and non mediatic That means you even don't need to dilate the people. You can just take the photograph and you can assess the different structure in the retina. So you can see this is the uh, mobile phone based smart uh, application. Now, a little bit of history of ophthalmoscopy. Uh, the history of ophthalmoscopy started on 1823 with the Zen Parkinze, where the complete technique of uh, ophthalmoscopy was initiated and after that, next 24, 25 years, lots of modification underwent in the ophthalmoscopy. And finally, Helmos in 1851, he discovered or invented the first usable direct ophthalmoscopy in clinical practice. Basically, there are three types of ophthalmoscopy. One is direct ophthalmoscopy, another is indirect, which is monocular, binocular, and another one is the indirect slit lamp biomicroscopy. Now coming to our main topic, direct ophthalmoscopy, it is a two types. One is traditional direct ophthalmoscopy, which we commonly use in our clinical practice. And even every ophthalmologist and even physician, you will use this one traditional. Nowadays, a little bit modification and patient comfortable uh, pan optic direct ophthalmoscopy is also is there. So the basic difference between traditional one and pan optic here you can see, just this, there is a uh, rubber made structure which is placed in front of the patient eye, which is uh, very comfortable to the patient as well. And as I have already mentioned, there is also indirect uh, ophthalmoscopy. So if we see the modern direct ophthalmoscopy, here is a light source within this uh, structure handle, the light source from the batteries. So the batteries is there. And the light source from this uh, battery is passes through this head and there is a mirror here you can see <clears throat> so there is a uh, light uh, battery is there light source is there and there a uh, mirror is kept is there whenever light comes from this handle it will be reflected back to the patient's eye and uh, illuminate the retina and the rays of light from the retina reflected back to the examiner's eye and we can see the fundus. So this is the basic principle of direct ophthalmoscopy, uh, which we can understand very easily. If we see the basic difference between direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy, the direct ophthalmoscopy 
causes the 15 time magnification of the retinal structures uh, in compared to the indirect, where is only two to three time magnification. But the major demerit of direct ophthalmoscopy is the field of view. What we appreciate is very less. Only 10 degree of the retina can be seen, whereas more field can be seen with other type of the ophthalmoscopy. And the image form is real. That means whatever you see in eye, it is the exact picture. And it is monocular. That is, uh, you can examine one eye at a time, whereas in indirect ophthalmoscopy, you can examine both the eye at a time. Uh, so it is a uh, steropsis is less. And uh, undilated pupil, uh, we can examine direct ophthalmoscopy in undilated pupil, but for indirect, we need the dilated pupil. So let's discuss about the part of ophthalmoscope. Direct ophthalmoscope has uh, mainly three parts. This is called head, this is neck and the body. And it has two surfaces. This is the surfaces having peep hole. It always faces toward the examiner. And uh, at the junction of the neck and the body, you can see there is a uh, on and off button. Uh, so we, you have to press it and slightly rotate it uh, to initiate the function of the direct ophthalmoscope. So the another person which is facing toward the patient, you can see there are lots of uh, things. At the top, you can see there is a convex, uh, concave mirror with a hole in the center. As I discussed in the principle that the ray of light illuminated through this light source is reflected through this hole into the patient's eye to illuminate the retina. And at the side, you can see there is a multiple lens strength selector wheel, uh, which you can rotate with your thumb or index finger as per your convenience to uh, adjust the different lenses. And in the center, you can see there is a different, you can see different color uh, circles and different apertures. So we'll discuss next slide, what about these things? <clears throat> so if you tilt the direct ophthalmoscope toward the side, you can see there is a wheel. If you turn the wheel in the clockwise direction, uh, so you can see there is a green number, a green number inside this. So these all are the plus power. So if you turn this wheel from up to down, you can see there is a red color number displayed through this hole. So these are the minus power, okay? So as I have mentioned, you just go to this, uh, uh, this structure. Here you can see there is a multiple uh, diagram. So what, do you, what this diagram tell you should be aware of that. Let's discuss this one by one. So the large, large aperture we seen in the direct ophthalmoscopy is to see the retina through the dilated fundus, uh, large and medium. So if you want to examine the patient retina in undilated state, it's better to use the small light because if you use the large light in undilated people, it will cause the further constriction and difficult for examination. So whenever you are examining your patients without dilating, always suggested to use the small light, small aperture in the direct ophthalmoscopy. And this half light aperture is used to examine, especially when the patient has cataract. And the red free light, it is usually used to get the better contrast for the better visualization of the retinal vessels and sometimes to see the any defect into the retinal nerve fiber. This is a better one. And blue light is basically for the any uh, defect or any lesion into the cornea after fluorescent staining. And this slit lamp is for the uh, to see any pathology in the macula. And the grid pattern is for the eccentric fixation. Sometimes if the patient complain that he is not seeing properly. In such condition, you can use this grid and ask the patient to look at the center of the grid. And if the light reflex focus in the center of this grid in ophthalmoscope, then the patient's uh, field of vision or focus is supposed to be normal. So this is the things which I explained. So examination, the prerequisite for examination is better to have a dark room or semi-dark room and always make a patient to sit in the chair in comfortable position with headrest and ask the patient to look at a slightly elevated or distant target to avoid the accommodation. And the basic rule is right, 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 or left, left, left. That means if for, for patient right eye, always use examiner's right eye and always do with right hand. That is, 
if you want to examine patient right eye, hold ophthalmoscope in your right hand and use your right eye and vice versa for left eye. Before going to the direct examination of the retina, we always recommend the distant direct ophthalmoscope. So what is distant direct ophthalmoscope? That means you can see in this picture, use your ophthalmoscope at least half meter distance from the patient. And first you watch the red reflex in the both the eye before examining the retina, just throw the light into the both the eye of the patient from the distance. So what, why this is important? So, so this is a closer look. And always be aware that whenever you use bright light, it may cause pupillary construction, constriction and sometimes it may be uncomfortable to the patient. So you have to properly instruct the patient. And sometimes this distant direct ophthalmoscopic also help to see the any misalignment into the ocular structure. So this is the basic thing. First thing you have to, whenever you do the ophthalmoscopic examination, first thing you have to do is the distant direct ophthalmoscopy to see the glow. This is the normal eye. Here you can see a beautiful red glow coming from the both eye. Whenever we illuminate with the direct ophthalmoscope, we can see the red, uh, pinkish or reddish reflex from the retina. So if there is any alteration on this light reflex, there may be the lots of different pathology. For example, if there is a corneal opacity, you can see there is the uh, obsequious or disturbance into the red light, light reflex. Similarly, if there is cataract, you can see there is a red reflex nearby, but in the center, there is a red reflex is obscured. Similarly, if there is a dense cataract, there is no red reflex at all. And sometimes red reflex totally be absent. And in some time, instead of normal red reflex, we can see this type of yellowish or whitish reflex. So what, what does this indicate? If there is a red reflex is absent, it may be significant that, especially in case of diabetic or hypertensive patient, there may be the underlying large hemorrhage inside the retina. Whereas if there is a yellow reflex instead of normal red reflex, especially in case of child, it should be extremely alarming. That means the eye, what we call this in medical term is a leukocoria, which signifies there's a, the eye or retina is harboring a big tumor, which may be the life threatening, this, which may be like retinoblastoma. So that is the very much importance of your distant direct ophthalmoscopy red reflex. Now, so whenever you are starting the direct ophthalmoscopy, always set the lens power at zero in the beginning. And if you are using spectacles or you are myopia or hyperopia or you are using plus lenses or minus lenses, always use your glass first. Better to do uh, direct ophthalmoscopy you with your prescription glass, okay? Then wear your glass if you have error, of if you don't want to do use your glass, then you have to set your error in the ophthalmoscope accordingly. If you are myopia or nearsightedness, uh, then you have to set accordingly. So if the patient is myopia or wear minus power, set the lens in ophthalmoscopy is negative or red, as I have mentioned previously. And if it is hyperopic or patient wear plus power, set the lens in green. And gradually approach toward the patients. And uh, once you go near to the patient, rotate the wheel in the side as per need to bring the clear focus of the retina. So these are, here you can see in this diagram, first of all, you have to set, set the power into the zero. Then you have to rotate either toward the plus or toward the minus uh, and wherever uh, it is so clearly, uh, then that is the point of focus. So if the patient is myopic, then you have to turn, uh, rotate toward this red sign. And if the patient is hyperopic, then you have to turn this one toward the uh, green one to make the clear focus. And once you see the, uh, once you complete all this procedure, now we come for the internal examination of the retina. So continue turning, focusing wheel, as I have mentioned to, first of all, you have to bring the retina or vessels in focus. Then follow the vessels to the disc and examine the rest part. Let's see. First of all, you have to examine, uh, then these are the things you have to note in optic disc. And once you see the optic disc, then you have to move temporarily to see the macula and other blood vessels. 
let's see so this is the uh, picture first of all what we have to do you have to identify the blood vessels here you can see the light is illuminating the blood vessels so once you see the blood vessels then just track the blood vessels toward the nose that is toward the nasal side which always uh, ends into the optic disc so gradually you like try, try to look toward the nasal side then what happens then you reach to the optic disc okay so once you see the optic disc you note note all the thing regarding optic disc then once you completing the examining optic disc in uh, third scenario you will examine the major vessels so there are lots of vessels so these are the major vessels where most of the changes in systemic disease occur so you did not don't need to examine all these minor vessels just this is we what we call as the first order vessels so we have to examine the first order vessel accordingly and after completing this finally you will look for the macula to visualize the macula you can simply tell the patient to look at the light of your ophthalmoscope and we usually suggest to examine the macula at the last because once patient look at the light of your ophthalmoscope it may be difficult to the patient so if you do the macular examination first and it may be difficult you to examine the other structure later on so we always recommend examine the retinal vessels first trace it toward the disc examine the major vessels and finally examine the macula to see the different pathologies and these are the different positions where you can uh, ask the patient to look up look down and you can uh, visualize the different quadrant of the retina accordingly as per your need so this is the primary position where i have made circle so these are the things as i am also already mentioning so now coming to let's see some of the scenario this uh, i have already mentioned this is the normal retina how it looks like optic disc major blood vessels so you have to uh, first of all know all these things then let's see some pathological condition so one of the important condition is the glaucoma where even you don't need ophthalmologist to diagnose a case of glaucoma and we all know that glaucoma is a sight threatening disease and most of the time the glaucoma patient is perfectly asymptomatic okay so they may be present sometime to the physician for routine checkup or blood pressure hypertensive patient so if you can catch up this patient with large you can see this is the normal optic disc and cop so if you see this is the large copping so you can refer this patient to the ophthalmologist for further evaluation and you can save the remaining vision so it is a quite rewarding okay so normal cop to disc ratio is 0.3 so uh, in case of glaucomatous it may be enlarging the second and commonest thing you always look for is the optic disc edema where you can see there is the blurring of the disc margin if we compare with the normal optic disc there is a blurring of the disc margin and there is a lots of hemorrhage and dilated retinal pain and it may be occur in case of papilloedema sometime in the with the raised uh, intracranial pressure or with grade for hypertensive retinopathy and third one is the optic atrophy so normal optic nerve head or optic disc is pinkish in color but in case of optic uh, atrophy especially sometime in long standing hypertension they may present uh, with the this uh, yellowish or chalky white color of the optic disc that is optic atrophy so let's uh, review one uh, is important uh, this one uh, literature so retinal vascular sign it is considered as a window to the heart you know, the journal has some of the articles have mentioned that you can predict the uh, incidence of the ischemic heart disease by just uh, seeing the retinal vascular sign so uh, here you can see they have mentioned that there are lots of uh, retinal vascular changes like arterial narrowing venar dilatation retinopathy focal narrowing these are associated with the increased risk of the coronary heart disease so by assessing simply the various changes in retinal vessels you can also uh, predict sometime with the uh, prevalence or incidence of the uh, coronary heart disease in future as well and let's have some of the uh, common conditions uh, which the physician most of the time encounter in their clinic the most one is the hypertensive retinopathy there are different uh, classification of hypertensive retinopathy i am not going to discuss the detail on this 
So uh, the most commonly used is this uh, CIS classification for hypertensive retinopathy and atherosclerosis, uh, this one. So the common in both of them are, uh, these are, these usually uh, implies for the long standing hypertension. These changes such as arterial narrowing and focal arterial constriction, retinal hemorrhages, and this uh, copper wiring, silver wiring, this is, uh, this indicates of your long standing hypertension. So let's see. <clears throat> so in the lower right picture, you can see this is the normal retinal, normal retinal arterial venous arrangement. Here you can see, just note this circle line at arterial venous crossing. This is the normal, you can see the artery is well above this one and the venous diameter. Normally, arterial venous ratio is 2 is to 3. That means uh, vein is a little bit larger in compared to uh, artery in normal status. But as the hypertensive changes progresses from stage 1, 2, 3, 4, there are lots of AV crossing changes. Here you can see what is commonly no, uh, called as arterial venous nicking. That you can see there is sclerosing of the artery. The thickening of the artery, it presses the underlying vein and this, you note this diameter and here there is the change in the course of the vein as well as there is the tapering at the end of the arterial crossing. So all these things are called as, you know, there is a cellar sign, bone sign, gunnet sign, there are the bonnet sign, there are the different types of sign. Whereas in stage 3, there is a hemorrhage in the retina and in stage 4, there is a papilloidoma. And in long standing, there are the copper wiring and the silver wiring. In copper wiring, a little bit uh, uh, less white, whereas in silver wiring, is you see the blood vessels is almost devoid of blood. There is no blood at all. So this is the completely sclerous blood vessel. And this, so most of the time we see that there is a disc edema and lots of retinal exudate. So these are the acute changes, which usually seen in grade three and grade four hypertensive retinopathy or what we call as malignant hypertension. This is usually seen in young patient because in those patients, uh, the regulatory system is or compensatory system is not much that developed. And it usually we see when the diastolic pressure is more than 120 milligram of mercury, the patient usually present with the grade four hypertensive retinopathy. And this interesting photo you can see, you can see there is an emboli. This is a case of branch retinal artery occlusion and the patient sometimes we simply, with the help of this direct ophthalmoscopic and fundoscopic examination, we can see the uh, retinal emboli. And this is the diabetic retinopathy. We can see there are lots of new vessels uh, coming through the optic disc. So what is the importance of this one? Uh, in this condition, patient vision may be normal. So most of the time, sometimes the diabetic patient in your clinic may present in this stage. At this stage, patient vision is absolutely normal. So he or she doesn't bother to come to ophthalmologist for eye examination because he thinks I'm, I'm seeing well, why should I go to ophthalmologist? So they definitely come to you for regular diabetic screening and simply by ophthalmoscopic examination, if, we, if you see lots of new vessels like the disc, so this is the time patient need urgent ophthalmologist referral to the retina specialist because if we can do the laser at this patient and these all these new vessels become regress and there is no bleeding. But if the patient stay at home thinking that my vision is okay and patient, these new vessels got ruptured and ultimately the patient become blind. So this is one of the most rewarding field where the direct ophthalmoscopy can save the vision of the patient also. And sometimes, not only the sight saving, the identification of retinal sign may be the life saving too. Here, uh, you can see there is a hemorrhage and in the center of the hemorrhage, there is a lots of white spot. So this is the, what we call it the Roth spot of subacute bacterial endocarditis. Similarly, uh, this is the patient presented to us with the lots of hemorrhages in both the eye. And uh, after investigation, we found the case turned to be the case of leukemic retinopathy. And this is the classical condition, if you, what we call as the pizza pie appearance. So if you see this type of fundus picture through your direct ophthalmoscopy, uh, 
especially in an immunocompromised patient, which is very classical of the CMB retinitis, what we call pizza pack retinitis, and it usually it usually appears when his or her CT4 count is less than 100. So the, my recommendation is always try to do direct ophthalmoscopy in, an, in every systemic vascular cases to your clinic as per you know. Always follow the systemic step for direct ophthalmoscopy. Uh, in, at the beginning time, you can uh, do the dilat dilated patient at the beginning. And once you get mastered, you can simply do in non-dilated cases. And don't hesitate to refer to ophthalmologist in case of any doubt and get, and get feedback from them also. And finally, practice, practice, and practice is the thing that makes always perfect to you. Thank you very much for your session. So if there is any questions, I am happy to take. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganendra. It's a wonderful session. Uh, first question, uh, in case of retinal hemorrhage, uh, then you said that patient may turn into uh, turn to blind. Mm. So if really it occurs, ultimately its end result is blindness or we can uh, reverse it or there is good treatment option for that. Definitely, if, uh, if the patient come, uh, it depends upon the scenario. So if the patient, uh, it is not said that every hemorrhage, retinal hemorrhage lead to the blind. If the patient come to the ophthalmologist in a correct time, there are lots of modalities. Initial phase, we try to do the laser. And this laser, retinal laser may also reduce the existing bleeding. And if it is too much of the retinal hemorrhage, then we can go for the retinal surgery to remove the hemorrhage from the eye. And if there is a long-standing hemorrhage, which is untreated, which causes the, uh, this, the hemoglobin or especially the iron present in the hemoglobin is toxic to the macula, which ultimately lead to the blind. So it doesn't mean that all hemorrhage ultimately turns to the uh, blind, but if we can manage it timely, we can definitely save the vision. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, question from Dr. Hassan Shaju. Is there counting vessel is important to identify optic atrophy yeah it, it is uh, it is cell that is that that is the it is called keston bomb index if we go in detail that is the comparing uh, counting the number of the small retinal vessels in the optic disc but it is not uh, practically it's very difficult it is not that much easy what we study in the book or like that but it has some significant uh, uh, for the determination of this optic atrophy but practically it's very difficult we don't we, even ophthalmologists we don't do practice this one. Okay. Uh, uh, full of compliments. Chat box is full of compliment about to your session. Yeah. And, uh, and our physicians want more session from you. I think you will obviously do that. Uh, next question for you. Sir, thank you for your wonderful session. It's obvious. It's wonderful. Uh, please teach us how to count the number of vessels in optic disc. Okay, so... Uh, is there any specific way or guide? I, I don't think there is any special way. Just you can see, there are major vessels, okay, small vessels and major vessels. For abnormal vessels, we don't suggest you to count the vessels. For the normal vessels, you can just... Uh, uh, it's very difficult to see with this uh, direct ophthalmoscopy. It's better to do with the fundus photography and indirect ophthalmoscopy. And we don't suggest physician for, to go for this very cumbersome procedure. I think it's not useful. Uh, next question, uh, how to ophthalmos uh, ophthalmoscope a patient with cataract? Yeah, in a patient with uh, cataract, as I have already mentioned, if it is a dense cataract, it's not uh, possible to see the retina with the dead one. And if it's a uh, very initial state of the cataract, you can use this. I have shown you this one half, half slit, half slit. You can use that one for the uh, see the retina through this uh, cataract lens. I'm also seeing the chat box and try to answer. <laughs> many, many questions. Yeah, one many, of, many. Next one question. Of, one of the interesting uh, questions I get that, how do we suggest uh, do a direct ophthalmoscopy in a COVID patient? I was expecting that question is very difficult. In this COVID area, we don't recommend to go very close to the patient to do the direct ophthalmoscopy. 
and uh, better to use mask in both the examiner and the uh, this uh, patient and do the direct ophthalmoscopy. Another good question for you, Dr. Ganandro. How to differentiate glucometer's disc from optic atrophy? Uh, that's an excellent question. So the, there are a few points. The first one is the uh, we see the, the glucometer's disc is more of the copying rather than the pill. Whereas the optic atrophy is the more of the paleness than the copying. That is the basic difference in the, this one. And in case of the optic uh, atrophy, you will see there is a generalized paleness or chalky whiteness of the disc. Whereas in case of the glucometer's optic at atrophy, you see there is a thinning of the optic, uh, you know, that's called neuroretinal dim. So these are the basic difference. Yeah. Uh, next question, sir, please explain about hard exudate, soft exudate, dot blot hemorrhage, cotonol exudate, etc. Is there any picture? Kanandra, then it will be nice if you. Yeah, I. I so the picture, then I think it. Yeah. Okay, let me share my slide, okay? Because uh, as I have uh, done this one in the. Visualization is important for these pictures, sir. Hard yeah. exudate, soft exudate, dot blot hemorrhage, cotton wool exudate. This four, if you can. Okay, let me see. So, are my slides uh, visible? Anyone can ask direct question. Can, yes. Okay, okay, let me. Uh, okay, just, just two at a time. I heard that during my diabetic retinopathy session, I mean, but I didn't include this time. <laughs> Sorry for that. But at least I have one slide in that. Let me just. Uh, okay. Okay. I think you have to take a minimum four to five session for us in future. So this, session with so just, this, uh, just I will show here. This is the hard exudate. You can see there is a small tiny yellow dots. So oh, this. Where is the slide? Where is the slide? We can see the slide. Okay. This one. Here. Have you seen the right one? There are no slides. No, sir. No slide. Just watch. Okay. We are in just your cover page. Okay, okay, just give me some time. Okay. Uh, now you can see, I think. Okay. Yes. Sir. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay. So this is one diabetic retinopathy. Here you can see this is the hard exudate. There are lots of this is nothing but this is the lipid. So hard exudate uh, and the soft exudate is the when there is the ischemia of the nerve fiber, there is a estesis of the exoplasm which leads to the soft exudate. And these are the hemorrhage. You can see this is the flame shaped and blot hemorrhage, and this small one is the dot hemorrhage. So these are the basic differences between this, all these things. Okay, there's a, another good question for you. Okay, you can now stop the slide sharing. Another question: if a patient has glaucoma, dilating with tropicamide will be harmful or not? Tell us something about. Uh, to great fundus. Okay, the, coming to the first question, uh, it is uh, not absolute contraindication of dilating glaucoma in case with the tropicamide, but definitely this is a very nice question. We should be aware that uh, uh, if it is a, we usually first of all before dilating the exam, we examine the patient in the slit lamp. That means if there is a, a shallow AC, what we we'll call if the anterior chamber is shallow, it's better to be very careful while dilating this one. And uh, uh, regarding the second question, what was the second question? You, you are muted, Dr. Hassan. Okay, uh, that's... What was the uh, second? Tigroid, tig tigroid, okay, tigroid fundus. Okay, so tigroid fundus is usually, tigroid means it's a tiger-like. If you just remember the skin of tiger, this is yellow and the black stripes, but uh, especially in case of myopic patient, when there is a high myopia, you can see there is a alternating this, this type of pattern in the fundus. This is simply the tigroid fundus, which is called. It has not that much significant clinically. Okay. Uh, please explain papilledema again, sir. Definitely. So papilloedema is simply disc edema. There is a basic difference between the papilloedema and the disc edema. So in both the condition, whether it is papilloedema or the disc edema, optic nerve head or optic disc is swollen, what I have shown in that picture. But until and unless there is no raised intracranial pressure, we don't uh, no, not uh, label it as a 
papilloedema. That means the definition of papilloedema is optic disc edema secondary to raised intracranial pressure is papilloedema. Otherwise, it is simply disc edema, no papilloedema. There are so, so many questions. If, <laughs> if anyone asks live question, uh, you can raise your hand, we'll allow. Uh, it's really tough for me to select the questions. Okay, I'm another question. Trying to... Can macular edema be confirmed by ophthalmoscope? Can macular edema be confirmed by ophthalmoscope or it need slit lamp or any other examination? Exactly. So but there is two raised hand already. Uh, okay, so then we will allow them. Okay, so we we don't say it's a con confirm. We cannot confirm with the ophthalmoscope with the uh, advent of newer technology, but you can suspect definitely. So what uh, for the physician? What I like to simply say that as I have shown you the figure of hard exudate. If you see such hard exudate in your diabetic patient during ophthalmoscope examination, please don't hesitate to refer to ophthalmologist because the best way to detect the uh, macular edema is the non-invasive, that is the optical coherence tomography, which is very simple procedure. And yes, yes, you can definitely assume with the help of the uh, direct ophthalmoscopy or indirect ophthalmoscopy, but we don't say it is a, uh, we have to confirm with the ophthalmoscope. Onik, please allow Dr. Modi Sharkar to ask live question. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, sir, both. For the for excellent presentation, sir. My query was how do we how do we see loss of venous pulsation in early papilledema? Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, you can uh, uh, the usually the venous pulsation is even uh, uh, absent in ten percent of the normal cases, so it doesn't have that much of significance. So you just uh, it usually signifies the raised intracranial pressure. So just uh, with the help of uh, we see usually what we will do we'll use uh, through this street lamp. We use the Goldman lens and we just press the, uh, this one uh, eye and we uh, induce the uh, spontaneous venous process. But with the help of ophthalmoscope, it's not possible. You can use the street lamp by microscope and with indentation or even with the help of the 90 diopter lens or especially Goldman three mirror lens. Thank you, sir. The next question, if the patient complains of discomfort or injury after using the ophthalmoscope, how should we proceed to manage the situation? Does it happen? <laughs> so uh, we have not <laughs> we have not encountered such question anyway. So the, there is uh, no such ocular injury. But definitely, uh, I, as I have mentioned, we are using the very bright flashes of light. Patient may uh, sometime uh, when you examine the patient, uh, you macula, you have to ask patient to look at the ophthalmoscopic light. So this may cause some transient discomfort and you should assure the patient, assure the patient that it is due to the bright light and it will go after a few seconds or minute. Nothing to worry, it's not going to harm you anyway. Otherwise, we have not encountered the major ocular trauma or like this with this maneuver. I think skilled physicians will do it very comfortably. Yeah. Next, I will take uh, another one or two. There are uh, so many questions. I will take one live question. And uh, okay, next question. There are many queries about papilledema. Mm -hmm. uh, in papilledema, where and what findings may we get? Is it macula or optic disc? No, it's a papilledema. Is simply it is a disc edema. The mainly changes you see in the optic nerve, that is optic disc, but definitely secondarily, sometimes macula may be involved, but the basically sign you have to see in the optic disc rather than the macula. Next question, another interesting question. Uh, just tell something about Foster Kennedy syndrome. Just tell something, you don't have to elaborate. Okay, so Foster Kennedy, there are two types. One is the Foster Kennedy syndrome and pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome. So, uh, First of all, Foster Kennedy syndrome, in both of the condition, what happens? One eye has the disc edema and another eye has the optic atrophy. Uh, if it is associated with the frontal lobe tumor or like that, so it is the true uh, Foster Kennedy syndrome. And what if there is a optic disc edema in one eye and optic atrophy in another eye, but there is no associated frontal lobe tumor or like that, it is called as the pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome.
Okay. Okay, Ganandu, I'm. Uh, okay, there is. Uh, so there is. Hand raise. Onik. Question, I guess. Uh, they just have... allow Dr. Mustafa Kamal. Okay. There, is, there are many questions. Uh, Onik, just allow Dr. Mustafa Kamal to ask a live uh, question. Only allow us in that question for the government. Thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. Uh, sir, I have um, some questions. Uh, first one is uh, how to differentiate the um, papilledema in case of glaucoma or is due to the any intraocular tumor or due to the any hypertensive cases? Okay. This one only? Okay. Oh, so, so papillary edema and hypertensive changes, as I have mentioned that hypertensive retinopathy, especially the grade 4 hypertensive retinopathy may present as a papillary edema. But as I am repeatedly mentioning, until and unless there is no race ICP, so you can, uh, and there is no evidence of systemic uh, diseases, so we label it simply as a disc edema. The basic difference is in case of hypertensive uh, disc edema due to hypertension, there may be the other associated hypertensive changes in eyes such as arterial venous nicking and, you know, arterial narrowing. But if it is a papillary edema, it is usually confined to the optic disc, whereas there is no other arterial changes you can see. And in glaucoma, it is obvious that in glaucoma, there is no disc edema usually. Uh, usually there is a, uh, there is disc copping rather than the disc edema. And one important thing you have to differentiate deep uh, papillary edema is usually with the optic neuritis. That is very much important. The basic difference is in optic neuritis, the vision is markedly de de reduced, where in this papillary edema, the vision may be normal. And another important one is RAPD, relative afferent pupillary defect. If you see the disc edema and there is no, uh, if there is a disc edema or you suppose papillary edema and you see, you see the RAPD, it is not a papillary edema, it is moving toward the optic neuritis. So these two things you must have to differentiate. Uh, sir, please take a session on optic atrophy yes, and papillary edema. Sure, sure. Uh, I wish that uh, the, I wish that Dr. Ganandu will take minimum five to six session in future. <laughs> so there are many questions. So I'm not going to take a further question today. Mm -hmm. uh, today I was feeling that uh, Dr. Ganandu is giving examination <laughs> to a very big board. They were asking really I, some wonderful question I, to him. I really he answered nicely. Starting from my residency and happy years, I love teaching. It's okay for me. So it's uh, okay. <laughs> then last question for today. Okay. Oh, which one I shall take? Okay. As I'm a dermatologist, for me, vasculitis is the important topic. Okay. So it's different. Yeah. Uh, so what are signs of vasculitis in fundoscopy? Uh -huh. Or when can be suspected systemic vasculitis? Okay. This is the last question for today. I okay. think it's enough. Systemic vasculitis, we have uh, one term called as retinal vasculitis. We also encounter the retinal vasculitis. The, so the basic uh, findings uh, which differentiating from other vascular diseases in case of retinal vasculitis, we can see it is called as the perivascular seething. That means just along the side of the blood vessels, you can see there is some sort of seething or yellowish deposition outside the vessels. And there is also uh, associated disc edema also. And uh, in vitreous, we said the inflammation that is called as the vitritis. So that is the basic difference to difference in, uh, between other vascular changes and the vasculitis because vasculitis is the inflammatory condition. Then what we have discussed all these hypertensive diabetes, uh, hypertensive especially, it is a non-inflammatory condition usually. So these are the points we can make difference in. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganandu. So this is a bit hard for you, Notun Diganto, new world, uh, new world you exposed. So thank you very much. And I think uh, we will continue with these sessions, many more sessions with you. Now, uh, i like to conclude the session. Uh, thank you very much, all the participants for excellent participations. Thank because you. Without this active participations, uh, it, uh, no session, um, ultimately it becomes shiny. So I like to offer uh, our today's speaker, Dr. Ganandu, few concluding words, then we shall uh, conclude our today's session. Uh, thank you everyone. I really enjoyed uh, this. So this, uh, this type of activity also uh, energize us to go through the books and read all these things. So it is also benefit uh, for us also. Uh, so thank you so much.
and uh, let's hope the omicron will go from this world uh, soon so thank you assalamu alaikum shabakhair halo thakun abar dekha hobe